how you can set up your developer environment to work alongside the content in the course. I'm also going to be providing you all of the source code to get you started quickly that you can, as you work through the lessons, you can work alongside the lesson content, try it out for yourself. We're going to be covering simple JavaScript with alerts, looking at how we can write JavaScript in attributes, how we can debug JavaScript with console log and we can output and communicate content into the browser. Also with JavaScript code, some of the core fundamental concepts of JavaScript, how it handles white space, commenting, single quotes, double quotes, then the fundamentals of JavaScript, like variables that are used to store data, how you two can set up variables, some of the rules in regards to variables, also how variables can be declared, different data types that are available within JavaScript, including numbers and text, booleans, and then later on within the course, we look at arrays and objects, operators and assignments of values, and how we can set up functions, which is one of the core building blocks of JavaScript. We've also included a number of exercises within the course, so you too can try JavaScript out for yourself challenge yourself and build out some really cool mini applications that are scattered within the lessons of this course. Also looking at JavaScript objects, we've got a number of exercises in regards to objects as well as arrays and all the really wonderful things you can do with arrays and all the methods that are attached with arrays. JavaScript conditions, switch statements, loops, and of course the document object model and how you can add event listeners, update and manipulate your HTML all using JavaScript. This course covers all of the core concepts of JavaScript, including building interactive and dynamic applications. So I know you're excited to get started, so let's dive right in and start creating some JavaScript code. In this lesson, I'm gonna be covering the tools and resources that I'm gonna be using in the upcoming lessons in order to demonstrate how JavaScript works. And I'll also give you a quick intro on what JavaScript is and how you too can write JavaScript and render it out within your browser. So first of all, there's a few tools that we're gonna need. And one of the main tools is you need a browser. And more than likely, you're already watching this video within a browser. So you probably already got that one done. And the browser that I'm gonna be using within the upcoming lessons, I'm gonna be using Chrome. The reason I'm using Chrome is because it's got developer tools. And with developer tools, you can click inspect. So I just clicked anywhere on the blank side of the page and it opens up this console. I've got it really big right now because I want you to be able to see the size of the script and the code. Uh, so let's just go down. What I did is you've got some options when you open up the window, you can dock it at the bottom, you can dock it to the left, dock it in a separate window or dock it to the right. By default, it's in the right. And because it was in the right and the text is super big and enlarged, I wasn't able to really see it. So I simply docked it to the bottom. And there's a number of tabs that are available. So there's elements. And the main one that we're focused on is console. So console, what that does is that gives us a way to communicate with JavaScript code and our browser. So you can in fact actually write JavaScript code and you could do something like hello, alert hello, and we are gonna describe that in the upcoming lesson. So not to worry, but you are able to write JavaScript in here and have that JavaScript get rendered out directly in the browser. So that's another reason that we're using DevTools is that we do have this ability to communicate, debug our code, and just find out more about what's going on with our code. So go ahead and open up the browser of your choice. And I do recommend if you do wanna follow on closely with what we're doing within the lessons to use Chrome, although you don't have to, I understand. And there's also the developer tools. So that's available at developers.google.com forward slash web forward slash tools forward slash Chrome dev tools. And this will give you all of the information you need to know and then some about what you need to know in order to use dev tools. But the main part of it is that we're gonna be using it to debug our JavaScript and as we develop our JavaScript and that's gonna be covered within the console. So that's the core area that we need to focus on in the upcoming lessons for the JavaScript that we're gonna be showing you. So the other tool is, and you do have a whole bunch of these that are available. The one that I'm using within the course is Brackets.io. It's an open source text editor. It's an Adobe product. So it's got quite a bit of stuff behind it and it's also pretty cool. It's got a lot of great properties and features. 
So I'm not going to go through all of them. It's just simply that it's a place to open up and write our code. And as a matter of fact, I've got it opened up here on the left hand side. So the setup that I'm going to be using within the upcoming lessons is I've got brackets here and I've minimized it on the left hand side. So I'm going to have my spot where I can write some code. And then on the right hand side, we're going to open up that index page. So this is the same one that I'm writing the code in and that's going to be available and visible here on the right hand side with the browser opened and probably for most of the lessons I'm going to have the console open as well. And you're going to get familiar with the console as we go through the lessons. So not to worry if you've never used it before, we're going to be showing you all the really cool things you can do with it as well. So now we are officially ready to write some code, write some JavaScript. And what I want you to do now is if you've never written JavaScript, open up your browser, Chrome preferably again, and then click that inspect, or you can go to the three little dots here you've got in your browser and you can open up your uh, more tools. And then under here, there's developer tools. There's a few shortcuts. They are different for Windows and for Macs. I'm on a Mac machine. Uh, so it depends on what type of machine you're on that the shortcuts are going to be different. But they all have developer tools and they all work the same way. So open up those developer tools, go over to the console. You don't have to put it at the bottom, but I just docked it at the bottom so that my space is really nice and neatly laid out. Uh, you could keep it docked into the right hand side or you could pop it open to an open screen. So what I want you to write is alert and then surround it by rounded brackets. So that's the shift nine and shift zero. And then inside, write yourself a message. And hello is always a great message to start with. So go ahead and write the message. You can do single quotes. You can also use double quotes, but the string content that you're writing, make sure that you're quoting around it. So even if you're doing something where you've got space, so if you've got hello world, and that would mean that you probably have some programming background if you're familiar with hello world. Uh, if you are putting some spaces in your message, then make sure that it's still enclosed within those quotes. And again, you could use single quotes, you can use double quotes, and don't worry about the undefined at the moment. Just uh, click enter, and you can see that it does get rendered out. So that's what we want to happen. We want this little pop-up to pop up, and you are ready to move on to the next step where we're gonna open up the editor and write some JavaScript. So that is still to come. Go ahead and try this out, creating an alert. Welcome back. In this lesson, we are going to be writing some JavaScript. So I hope you had an opportunity to try that alert out in your console. One of the things with the console, which is really neat, and you're probably wondering, well, how does that render out JavaScript code? And this kind of goes into how JavaScript works. So the way that JavaScript works, so it's a dynamic programming language, and when it's applied to an HTML document, such as index.html, it provides the ability to create some interactivity so dynamic interactivity on your website. So what happened here is that we were using the alert object. So this is a predefined function or method. And of course, we are going to be covering these in more detail. So what it is, it's a contained kind of unit that already has a preset number of commands. And once you invoke that, what happens is that the browsers will understand what alert is because they've got JavaScript written within the browser and they know how to render that out. Uh, so what it does is it reads this code and simply runs the code. So it's the same thing that if I had an alert here within JavaScript and I typed hello. So if I did the same thing over here, this time when I refresh the page and refresh index.html, boom, there we go. There's our message, hello. And that goes into how you write JavaScript. So you have a number of ways to write JavaScript. And also, if you notice that this is a file that's simply sitting on my computer. So I'm not running a server. It's not uploaded anywhere. It's simply running directly from the file path where it's sitting on my computer. And that's the file that I've got opened over here. And the way that it works is all you need to do is open up an HTML file within your browser and it can render out that JavaScript. So it does need the HTML in order to render out the JavaScript. So keep that in mind because you also have the option and I'm sure you've seen that before where we've got JS files 
those JS files won't render out within the browser without an HTML container. So you do need that HTML container. So let's open up our HTML code and take a closer look at what are our options for writing JavaScript. And right now we have some plain. This is just a really plain template. So I've got my HTML, opening, closing head, opening and closing body and closing HTML. And then within here, I've got a title that just says JavaScript. So it's kind of irrelevant, all of this other stuff here. This is just a simple HTML document. And that's all you need to get started and connect JavaScript to it. So there are a number of options with JavaScript. And you see I've got this nice div here that says JavaScript, of course. And we've got a button. And with buttons, if you're familiar with HTML, you might have seen that you can add in attributes. So I could do something like on click. And what onClick will do is this gives us the ability to add an event listener. So what happens now is whenever we click the button that something happens. So let me actually get rid of this alert because we don't need that. And let's uh, refresh and we click it. But we haven't given it any JavaScript to render out. And this onClick attribute here within the HTML element is actually going to give us the ability to render that JavaScript out. So let's create some script and what we're going to do is we're going to use our friendly favorite alert and you often see times that uh, this is the main introduction to javascript and these alerts but you don't really use them much in coding so i am going to cover it briefly just as an introduction a very easy one to have something happen that's visual and that's why it's used typically but it, within the coding of javascript you're not going to use it very much so that's just a little bit of a tip there uh, so now we've got our button so button type attribute is still there we've got on click alert JavaScript and we've got our JavaScript there. So let's see what happens. So we refresh the page, nothing has happened yet. And that's because it's waiting for that interaction. And that's what JavaScript does. It gives you the user the ability to interact with your web page. So it makes it come to life and gives you the ability to say, okay, well, here's a button or what looks like a button and let me click that. And wow, we can see something happened. It said hello to me. And this is the beginnings of JavaScript. Now, when you are typing JavaScript, of course, you can do it this way, but this way really isn't the best way to apply JavaScript to your elements and to your page. So we're gonna get rid of that. And we're gonna show you other ways of connecting your JavaScript to your web page. So another way to connect JavaScript, and we already did that down here before, is that we've got the script tag. So this is just, looks like HTML. And of course, you can connect out your script tag and you can add in your JavaScript here. So we've already seen this, but just to kind of repeat. And uh, what uh, brackets does is it gives you a little bit more information about all these methods, because there are a lot of different built-in methods. So display an alert dialog with the specified content and an okay button. So that's what alert does. So basically it tells you what alert does. And we can write our JavaScript in here, refresh it, and it renders it out. Now, the other thing about JavaScript is you can place it in a number of spots. So sometimes you're gonna find JavaScript placed here at the top of the page. So it's the same script tag. And let me make this, get rid of some of this white space here. So this is that same script tag that is sitting within the head section and refresh. And wow, we've got our JavaScript rendering out as well. Probably wondering, well, what happens if I place JavaScript in both? So now we need to distinguish between them. So we've got hello one and hello two. And first, hello one runs. And you can also notice that there's nothing built on the web page yet. And that's because hello, until you've hit OK, it won't continue past the script. And that's an important thing to note about JavaScript. And without getting into too much detail for now, it's just important to understand the way that the browser is rendering out this web page content, it's coming in from the top, It's come, and then when it hits the JavaScript, it says, oh, there's some JavaScript here. I'm gonna render this out, hello one. And it doesn't continue to output any of this, even though it's aware of some of the stuff here down below, it doesn't continue to output it until you've taken the action and uh, added in what you wanna do with this JavaScript. So once you hit hello, then it continues to render this out and we see that it goes through body and it goes through script here 
and it sees, oh, there's another alert before I render out that content, and this is more JavaScript that I need to take care of. So once this hits OK, then it finally displays the content. So keep that in mind, and it's not exactly in sync with what happened with the HTML, because if it was rendering out the HTML and the JavaScript at the same time, then we would have seen the content being output. So what it does is it runs through, does the JavaScript, and then it finishes with the HTML. So that's why it's important that when you are writing your JavaScript, if you are interacting with your HTML, make sure your HTML has loaded because you don't want to try to interact with any of your HTML elements. And of course, if you're doing an attribute on click, you're fine with doing it because it's going to render it out when it renders out that element. But typically when we're writing JavaScript, we need to make sure that all of the HTML has rendered out, and I am going to show you that in the upcoming lesson. So there's one other way before we wrap this lesson up and to write JavaScript. And just a quick note that where you place it within the head where you or the body. So with JavaScript that I'm usually writing, I place it within the body because I want it to render out as much of the HTML and the content above it before it tries to write the JavaScript, render the JavaScript in case I come into any problems or in case I've got a lot of JavaScript and there's some type of errors in there or something like that. And also if I want to interact with the DOM, I usually place my JavaScript at the bottom is what I'm trying to say. And that's right before the body tag before the closing tag. But you can also place it in the top as well. So that's a matter of preference. So one of the last ways to bring JavaScript in, and I'm gonna, and you can also bring it in as many times as you want, so keep that in mind as well. So we can link it to a file. So all we need to do is specify the source. Source is within the attribute, and the source, I don't have one yet, so I'll call it script dot js close that off so nothing actually goes between the tags here and it's the same as the script tags here except we've specified a source so let's create that source file we're going to place our alert in there and also keep in mind you don't need the script tags anymore because this isn't html anymore this is how you create a js file so i've got my index file there index.html and now i've got my script js and just to show you that this one is working, let's make this one different. So that's gonna be alert three. So let's refresh the page. Surprise, surprise, there we go. We've got our message because we've linked to our JavaScript. There's hello number three being popped up. So now it's up to you. So I know I've gone in through quite a bunch of different ways to attach JavaScript into your page. And I do want you to try these out for yourself and get familiar with them. So first of all, try out within the element and you can do the on click and then within the on click, then you can just do whatever function. And there is one important note here that we do need to keep in mind that this method, because we've got double quotes for the attribute values, you need to use single quotes in here. Because if you use double quotes, you're gonna break out of that function and then it's gonna cause a problem. So always keep that in mind, and this does get a little bit tricky when you've got the double quotes, the single quotes, and it could just as well be single quotes and double quotes. You could mix and uh, match them, but as long as you're opening and closing with the same one, you're ready to go. So bring in JavaScript, add it into as a script tag, try out the alert as a script tag, and then lastly, create your script JS file and try it out there as well. And coming up next, I promise you, we're going to get into some more interesting JavaScript than these alerts. So we're going to be dropping the alerts and moving along into something more interesting. So that's all to come. Welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to be writing some JavaScript. And that's one of the nice things about JavaScript is that you actually want to see and make it interact and update some of your content and visual content within your HTML page. Again, main purposes of JavaScript is that interaction and creating that dynamic content. So let's get rid of the, con the button here. And we are going to be revisiting that a little bit later on. And we're also going to get rid of linking out to the script file. In order to keep things fairly simple and straightforward, we're going to be writing all of our JavaScript within this index.html and then just simply saving them as the proper lesson names. And typically when you are developing your web projects, you would be linking out to a script.js file. And there are a lot of benefits to that. Just as 
you don't want to have your JavaScript within your elements as attributes because they are difficult to find if you've got a lot of code. So it's easier to separate it out just as you do with CSS. The same thing with the uh, JS files. Uh, if you've got a really big website and you want to use the JavaScript across multiple HTML pages and have it do the same type of functionality, then you can simply link out to your script file, save you a lot of time and effort. So it's a great way to go and it's a great option with JavaScript. So now let's write some script. And as promised, I do wanna make and write out some JavaScript code. So first of all, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started into the code. So there are a number of ways that we can write JavaScript. And as we saw in the earlier lesson, if I refresh this page, I can write in my JavaScript within my console. So there is a thing called the document, and this is the document object. And what it is, is essentially when your browser renders out all of your HTML page, it renders it out into the document object or otherwise known as the DOM. And as you can see here, the document actually contains all of the information that's available within my web page. And there is actually a better way to actually see this more visually and out output it. So there's a number of ways to communicate with your console. So there's console log. And the one I'm gonna use is console directory. I'm gonna take that same document object and place that into console directory. And see it put, outputs that document again, but this time it's got it within the document object model. So this is a set of all the different pieces and elements that are available within your page. And it gives you a quick overview of how the browser is actually building out your web page. So you can see you've got your document elements and really there's just a ton of stuff here, child nodes, and you can see head, text, body, and all of this. And what this basically means is, and I don't really expect you to memorize all of this stuff, uh, just know that it's there and this is what we're connecting with when we're writing our JavaScript. And in order to connect with it, so just as we did console directory here, we know that whatever code we write here on the right-hand side, we can also write in the left-hand side. So I'll make this a little bit bigger and I'm gonna simply copy and paste it in. And another thing to note that I've got uh, semicolons at the end of each one of these statements. So every time you do a statement in JavaScript, you should include the semicolon. It's not gonna break if you don't, uh, but it is good practice to keep that in line there. So let's refresh the page. And just as we saw those alerts popping up, we see that now we've got that document object being rendered out. So I don't have to type this console directory in here anymore within my console. I can actually automatically get it output. Also another side note, so console directory and console log is our way to uh, communicate with what's happening within the console. So this is meant for developers and it's not meant for the general viewer of your website to be consuming that. And as you can see, they don't see that this is happening behind the scenes. And this is all information that's available anyway. Uh, we're just writing it out and we're console logging it out in our console. So this is a console, well, that's why it's called console. When we console log and console directory, we can take a closer look at it. And that's the whole purpose when we're debugging our applications while we do console logs and console directories. And again, more on that in the upcoming lessons. Uh, so we've got our URL uh, where the file is located which is really cool because this is a huge JavaScript object and it gives us the ability once again to connect to this and I'm gonna be covering objects in more detail. So if you wanna have some fun or if you've got a few hours to kill, you can always go to console directory and look through all of the document, how it's being represented. Uh, so next, what I wanted to do is I wanna to connect to this JavaScript, this word JavaScript. And for now, let's do a quick update and we're just gonna change this to an H one tag. So h1 closing, h1 opening tag, refresh it, and there is my h tag. So this is just regular uh, HTML, h tag, head tag, header tag. And as you can see, console directory still outputs, console log still outputs. And that's the difference between writing it within the console here, because every time you refresh the page, this information is gone. And when you write it in your file within your source code, every time you load the page, the browser renders out that information. So that's the big difference there, as in case you were wondering. Uh, so next, let's connect to this particular element and update the content of it. And we can do this really easy with JavaScript. 
So the first thing that we want to do is we want to select that document object. So that's that same one that we see over here on the right hand side with all of these values and all of this information. And of course, we are going to be doing more on this in the upcoming lessons. So next, what we want to do is a built in method within JavaScript, and that's query selector. And you are going to start getting really familiar with these, especially query selector. It's used all the time. And we're going to grab our h1 tag. So we have, just like we're using CSS, we can select elements within our page as we're able to grab that h1 tag. And now we're going to do some, have some fun with this. So we've got another function. So these are a set of built in functions in JavaScript called inner HTML. And that inner HTML can equal whatever we want it to equal. What's going to happen here? And let me get this all on one line. So unfortunately, I've I think I've made the text a little bit too big. So let's make it a little bit smaller. And I'm also gonna move them in over to the left-hand side. And typically you wanna align it within the script tags, uh, but just cause I've got limited real estate here, I've just pulled them all over to the left-hand side. Uh, so we've got our document query selector. So that's the function. So just think of it just as the alert. Think of it as the log, as the directory. These are all built in methods functions within JavaScript. And we are going to be covering them in more detail. Please bear with me uh, while I just show you how we can update that inner HTML. And then everything else, what we've done here, we're going to be dissecting in the upcoming lessons and really getting familiar with what's happening here. Uh, so we're making our selection. And again, this one is a purple color as well. So that's a built in value within JavaScript. So the inner HTML, and then it's expecting a parameter. So we're equaling it to Hello world. So what do you think is going to happen here? Just quickly looking at this. So we know we've got this document object, huge, full of all kinds of information. We're using a method that's contained within there uh, where we're finding, just like we do with CSS, finding the, our HTML elements. And we don't really have a whole lot here. So we've got an H1 and we've got a button and we're grabbing that, selecting that, and we're placing that inner HTML of it and we're equaling it to hello world. So another way to kind of look at this, and let me clear this one up, is I can do document.querySelector h1, and we see that when I click that, it's returning that element information. And that's important to note. So again, what do you think is gonna happen when I refresh the page? And notice this inner HTML, uh, what do you think is gonna happen here? And if you said that the JavaScript is gonna magically transform into hello world, you are correct because that's exactly what happened here. Whenever we connected with that element, this element no longer says hello world. And if I try to access it again with the query selector, now the value has changed. And that's where JavaScript is dynamic. So this is an important core principle of JavaScript is that it's dynamic. It's a living web page. We can change things. We can grab things. We can interact with things on the web page. And it's all contained within this document object. And this is where the true connection with JavaScript and HTML is. If you aren't familiar with JavaScript and if you think we're going a little bit too fast, I am going to be covering this in more detail, but this is an important core principle of JavaScript. And I know a lot of people are excited to get started with JavaScript and they want to make things happen and change within your web pages. So that's why I've started out with this within earlier lessons and coming up, we're going to be doing some dissection of this and find out what the meaning of all of these, uh, all of these methods really truly is. So now it's up to you. I want you to try this out for yourself. So go ahead and take a look at the document object. You can console directory, or you can open up the browser that you're watching the video in right now, open up the console and do console.directory and then bracket around document, type that in, paste that in, and that will give you the document object of the current page you're on, which will be different than the document object that I'm on because the values are different. And this is what the browser is using in order to, this is what the browser is rendering out its rendition of the web page content. So it's, if your HTML is different, your document object is going to be different. And then we've got our console log dot hello. So that's just a quick message. So just as you were doing the alerts, send yourself a console log message, make, uh, say hello to yourself or some other interesting message, send yourself an interesting message essentially. So that's the second part of the challenge. And then last but not least is the document use query selector 
and select an element on your page. So even if this was H, and you can play around with this a little bit. So you can select that H2, and you can see that H2, now it's selected that. If you had kept this as H1, nothing would happen, and we actually wouldn't be able to make that selection and we'd throw a JavaScript error. So more on that later on. So make sure that whatever element you're trying to select actually exists. That's the important part of JavaScript. And then you can use the inner HTML and equal it to, again, whatever message you want. So I know there's quite a few challenges here. So do try these out. In the next lesson, we're going to dive deeper into the meaning of all of this. This lesson, we're going to be covering off some JavaScript syntax. So previously, we saw how we can use Query Selector, interact with our HTML, and we also saw console log and console directory. So there are a few things to note when you are writing JavaScript. And the way that JavaScript handles white space, the way that JavaScript interacts with itself, and also how you can do debugging with JavaScript. So first of all, console log and console directory that were introduced in the last lesson, this is where you can communicate within the console. So this is behind the scenes, gives you some more information on what's happening. There's also a few other ways to communicate with other developers and as well as yourself or your future self when you go back and you look at this code and you wonder, what was I doing over here? Why was I writing hello world instead of JavaScript? So you have the ability to make comments. So comments are done with doing the two forward slashes. And then in here, you can write comments. And what happens with a comment is you're not going to be able to see it. So this is strictly for other web developers, anyone that's looking at your code, including yourself, to kind of reference later on. There's also block comments. So you could do comments, and then you could do a number of lines of comments. And sometimes that's a little bit tedious. So new line, and so on, and so on. So you might want to do a whole block of content. So let's say, for instance, all of a sudden you don't want this information and these functions being invoked. So you can block it out. So forward slash asterisk, and that blocks out a chunk of code that isn't going to be visible. There's also white space and how white space is handled within JavaScript. So we saw over here we have an equal sign and We've got spacing here and spacing here. So you could get rid of the spacing if you wanted to. And do you think it'll still work? And if you said yes, you are correct. So just like with when we're typing our HTML code and we refresh it, it still works. All of this extra white space is ignored. The spot where the white space isn't ignored is between the, the quotes and what's going to actually happen here when I refresh it, we're not going to see any different, any difference. Because what's happening is that all of this white space, because it's rendering out HTML, it's being actually ignored because we're writing out strict HTML. And even though if you do go to the source here, and I know within the browser here, you can go into the source. So this is actually the same thing as writing this within your HTML. And if you are familiar with HTML, the way HTML handles the white space, it only creates that one space. So even though if this is on a new line, it will handle it within that same format. And if you saw what just happened whenever I created the new lines, JavaScript doesn't work the same way. So whenever I create a new line, it's expecting a new statement. So when I refresh it, we're going to see that the JavaScript actually breaks and JavaScript doesn't get changed to hello world because instead of uh, just the empty spaces, I created line breaks and those are a no-no within JavaScript. So you don't want to be putting lines like this and refreshing it because it does become problematic. So it's problematic within here, but it's not problematic within when you're writing out your source code. And that's why when we are writing out our source code, we've got a number of options to make it look nice and neat. We can get rid of the spacing here and we can represent it. And also when you're doing indentation, you can see that by default, whenever I start a new line, brackets is already trying to do that indent of the code. So it's trying to keep it nice and neat every time we've got a break here that we've got a new block, then it's trying to indent that block. So that's what's happening within brackets. And also when it comes to JavaScript, 
The way that it works is for readability, you might want to do it this way as well, where you've got this part of the statement, and then this could automatically be on a new line. So even though if you don't need to set it to new line, you can set it to a new line. And even when I make it bigger, it can still be sitting on the new line. And that's how line, line length and line breaks work. So when you are writing your code, if you do want to make it neat and so on, you already want to make those line breaks, you can do that as well. There's also in cases when you're blocking chunks of code together. Uh, so those are code blocks. So essentially those are blocked together and JavaScript uses a series of brackets. So it uses these rounded brackets. It also uses these curly brackets. And we are going to be getting into that in the upcoming lessons. So there's also a few really uh, there's a few keywords within JavaScript, and it does take a reservation on that wording. Uh, so there are ones that are used that are the default methods. For instance, you can't do something like alert without actually doing the alert method because this is already built in to the browser. So it's already expecting that function with those parameters. So you can't change that, basically, and as well as document. It's not a good idea to rename the document and do something different with the document because these are uh, words that are being used within JavaScript. And there are some very common ones and we are going to be covering those off as well. So always keep that in mind when you are writing your JavaScript that there are reserved keywords as well. So now that we've covered off basics of writing JavaScript, you're ready to start writing some more JavaScript. That's coming up. This lesson, we're going to be covering variables. So this is an important core concept when you're writing programming, and especially within JavaScript, this is going to be very important. So let's open up our browser, and we can see that we, what we've done before, we were able to write in some functions and have the browser render those out. So what happens if we do 4 plus 4? We see that the browser returns back 8. Let's do three plus four. See it returns back seven. What if we do test and we quote around it? It returns back test. Notice the double quotes. As with the double quotes or the single quotes with JavaScript, those are interchangeable as long as you're starting with the one that you're finishing with. So we see that what's happening here is that JavaScript is doing a calculation and returning back a value. And what happens as well if these values are changing? So we've got a number of different ways that we can interact with our content. And there's a number of different data types that we're going to be covering. And we're going to look at these in more detail as we go through the upcoming lessons. But for now, it's just important to understand that there are some core key data types. And they're actually written differently in JavaScript. So these ones here that are glowing blue within the browser, these are numbers. And of course, they're numbers, they're digits, uh, but technically they're known as the data type of number. And then these ones are technically known as a data type of string. So you can also have a number that is a string, but you can't have a string that is a number. As when we do something like hello, JavaScript is actually looking for something different. And that's a data type. And it's actually looking for a variable called hello. And with JavaScript, variables are the way that we can contain data and we can store data for later use. So let's say, for instance, we set up a variable. And in order to set up a variable, you need to declare it. So you can use var to declare it and then give it a name. So I'm going to give it a name of a. And then over here, we're going to have a value for it. So a is going to be equal to hello. So every time we try to use a, we're going to see that hello gets returned back. If we take b and we set a number, and notice that there's no quotes around there, and we return back b, b is returned back as that number that we initially declared it as. And that's how variables work. They allow us to store information. And the really cool thing about variables is, hang on to your seats, that they can change values. So then once the variable's been declared, that variable always sits there within the memory of the browser. And if we want to keep it within the memory of the application, we need to, or if we want them to initiate 
within the application, just as we did with the console log, we have to do it over here on the left-hand side within the source code. So let's try that again. And A will be equal to hello, and B will be equal to 10. So now when I go into my console, these ones are already within the application. So just like when we did the query selector in our HTML and we updated it, we see that we were able to return that information back. So A is now equal to hello and B is equal to 10. But it doesn't have to be that way. We can change what A equals to. We can change A and with the equal sign, we can change it to world if we want. So now whenever we return back A, the, it's equal to world. So it's stored essentially a new value and we've changed the initial value that we had when we started out the application. So initially we declared A, so A was gonna be a container, we we're gonna store values into it and we said, okay, well A initially is gonna be worth hello and B is gonna be worth 10. And we can see that we could recall those and then we can update them as well. So we can also do something like B and it doesn't have to stay the same data type. So B right now is 10, but what if we change B to hello? So now we've got B is hello, A is world. And let's add B plus A, and we'll see what gets returned back is hello world. So we're able to work with variables, combine variables, and variables can actually equal new variables. So if we do something like C equals and then let's put a space in here. A, what do you think the result of C is gonna be? So when we look at C, it's gonna output hello world. So every time C outputs hello world. And remember again, we've set this value, we've declared the value variable C dynamically within the browser. So that means that when we refresh it and the code loads, we didn't have it within our code. So let's go ahead and add it in our code. So now whenever we output C, we can see that C is equal to 10 hello, and whoa, what happened there? And that was within that instance of the browser that we were making those updates. So in order to make the updates, we need to update it within the source code. So this is where the challenge comes in for you. What I want you to do is to output hello world into the console. So when you refresh the page, hello world should be displayed here. So go ahead and try that out and I'll show you the solution as well. So pause the video, try it out, and I'll show you how to make those changes. So just as we saw within the instance of JavaScript where we redefined those values, we see that we can say A and equals world now. Let's uh, uppercase that. And we can take B and we can redefine a new value and let's do hello. So let's uh, refresh and we see when we output C, it's still 10 hello. So what happened there? And remember what we were looking at earlier with JavaScript, it executes it within that order. So if initially when we come in, we set hello to that and B to that, when we declared C and we created C, it equaled B plus A. So we've got a number of options. We can simply declare C here, and this is how you declare a variable, and then we can reassign the value when we've updated A and B. So now when we refresh and we do C, it actually equals hello world. And then in order to output it, we saw this before in the earlier lessons, we output it into the console log, and in order to grab the variable, which saves us the trouble of using those strings because remember, C now is storing those values and we can access those values within that state uh, just by accessing that variable C. So that's how we can output C when we refresh the page. So let's watch what happens. So the solution to this was to update the value of C after we update the value of A and B and then output it into the console. So go ahead and try this out for yourself. Have some fun with it, update some of these values, change the values, and then output it into your console. And coming up next, we're going to look deeper into variables and data types, and I'll show you even more really neat things that can be done with them. 
In this lesson, we're going to be covering variables and how they work and essentially JavaScript in action. So in the previous lesson, we saw how we can declare variables. So we had a number of options there. We also ha saw that we can reassign values to those variables and that they're not set in the particular data type. So let's explain this a little bit further. So initially in the previous lesson, I was assigning variables A, B, C, which is not very meaningful. So if I have a variable and if I do something like score, that's a lot more meaningful. So I'm allowed to do use actual real words. And if we do something like player or score player, then we usually, if we have a second word, we don't create any spaces there. We usually uppercase the next word. So we do lowercase for the first word and uppercase for the next, and then uppercase for the next words after that as well. So that's the way that we do this, the separation. So when you are creating variables, you can only have a variable name. So that's this part over here and have it contain either letters, digits, and you are able to use underscores and you are able to use dollar signs as well. So you're able to use any one of those in order to create the name for the variable. Also variable, they must begin with either a letter or the dollar sign or the underscore. So even though they can, can contain numbers, so this is valid, so you might have score one, you might have score two, so you might have another variable, score two and so on, and variable score three. So this is all very valid. And if it makes sense within your coding, then you're able to do this as well. But you can't start these values with numbers because the problem is that if you start it with a number, then it's gonna actually think that it's a number. So it's not gonna be able to understand. And we see that brackets actually goes kind of black and green because it sees the number as a number, but it sees this as text and doesn't know what to make of it. So don't start it with numbers. And you also can't use reserved words. So there's a number of different reserved words in JavaScript and we are gonna be covering them as we go through. So words that are used within JavaScript, it's a good idea to keep them separate and to create your own wording for the variable names. Another thing to remember about variables is that they are case sensitive. So if for instance, you have score four, it's not gonna be the same as score four because we've got uppercase, lowercase. So these are in fact actually two different variables. And the way that we use variables, because they are containers for values, we assign values to it. And that's our first operator that we're looking at within this course is the equal sign. So the equal sign basically allows us to equal this to whatever the value of this is. For instance, we, let me clear this up and we set a, let me refresh and uh, we set a variable of D to equal 100, and then we declare a variable of E, and then we do D equals E, then what do you think D is gonna be? And if you said it's undefined, you're correct, because D has now lost its initial declaration, and when you just simply set a variable, so all of these ones that I set over here, they're simply being set as undefined. So there's no value, it's completely empty, it's not holding any value when it's being declared. And if I assign a new value, so let me try that one again. So let's do variable D equals 100, variable E equals, and if we've got D, well let's just, uh, we'll declare variable E, and now we'll do E equals D. And notice order is important. So when we do E equals D, then we're assigning the value, same thing, because D we know is equal to 100. So if we assign the value of E to be whatever D is holding, then that's where we get the value of 100. So what do you think the value of E is? Quickly, it's 100. If you said 100, you're correct. So essentially that's how we work with variables. We first, number one rule, declare them. Number two rule is make sure that you're naming them properly and usually try to pick something that's more meaningful within the names. And then lastly, then assign values to it, and then you can switch between the different values and reassign new values. 
There's also a shorter format. So if you're declaring a bunch of variables that you're gonna be using later on, you can actually comma separate those out. So you could do something like score and you don't have to keep doing that var. You could just simply declare a whole bunch of them like this. And actually I'm gonna get rid of that uppercase one uh, to avoid any confusion. So if we refresh, then this is another valid way. And, and if I type in score one, we see score one, score two, and so on, and it returns back undefined. What we've seen with various data types is we've already looked at strings. So that's one type of data type, and we've looked at numbers as well. And with strings, we can also write them with single quotes. So we can work that the same way. And if we want to include double quotes, if we're using single quotes, then we're okay to use double quotes. But what happens if we want to use double quotes for consistency sake? We've got double quotes on the outside and we also you want, want to use double quotes within that string value. And that's where we can use the backslash. And what the backslash does is it allows us to break in and out of the string without actually breaking out of the string itself. So we're able to use the quotes and use these types of characters. And therefore, whenever we're outputting A, we see that it's outputting as hello world. So let's uh, try that again and let's uh, quickly refresh the page. And I am reassigning the value of A, so let's comment this stuff out here. So we see that now the value of A is hello and then we've got the quotes for world. And we also saw that we can reassign. So with JavaScript, there are dynamic data types. That basically means that it's not tied to one specific data type. Within some programming languages, once you declare it as a string, it has to stay a string. But with JavaScript, we're a whole lot more flexible and we can actually switch. And what we saw earlier is that we declared it as a number, but then we also assigned a string value to it and it turned out that it was a string value. So we can do things where when we refresh it, we can actually find out the data type so there's a method in order to do that. So that's uh, just like what we saw earlier, we use type of, and then we can do A, and we see that A comes back a string. If we do type of B, we see that B comes back a number. So that's the data type that it is. There's also a few other data types that are used commonly within JavaScript. And one of the most common ones is a Boolean. So a Boolean, and I'm gonna set this to a Boolean value. Uh, so we'll just set it as false. And notice that there's also no quotes around the Boolean values, and that's because it's either true or false. So this one is Boolean. Uh, the one above it is a number, and the one above that one is a string data type. So these are the different data types that are commonly used. And then also there's gonna be arrays and objects, and we're gonna look at those later on within the course. So now it's up to you. Get familiar with variables, try it out for yourself, do some declaration of the variables. You can declare a whole bunch at once, update the values, play around with the values, even try the Booleans as well. So these are either true or false. So you can set them as Boolean values. And then you can also, if you're unsure about what the data type is, you can find out what the data type is by typing in the function type of, and you can see that it returns back Boolean. This lesson, I've got an exercise for you. What I want you to do is take what you've learned in the earlier lessons and apply that you're gonna update the word JavaScript to say, hello world. And you're gonna use variables in order to do that. So let's update this statement and we're gonna just call it message. So take what you've learned in the earlier lessons and make this work. Have the value of message contain hello world, and then output that instead of JavaScript here. So don't change this line of code, change the other lines of code. Pause the video, try it out for yourself, and try to fix this error where it says message is not defined. And that's actually a clue within the troubleshooting and debugging of what's wrong with this. Pause the video, I'll show you the solution coming up. So the solution for this is to declare a variable called message. And the variable message is going to hold that word, hello world. So what's happening here is that we're declaring a variable message and then we're assigning a value to message and that's a string value and it's equal to hello world. So now whenever we call back message, we can see that whenever we type in message over here, that we see that it's equal to hello world. And that's why when we're updating the inner HTML, 
of the H2 element with the value of message, it actually writes out whatever message we've got there. You can change this as well. You can do message hello world 5 and even customize your own message to suit your needs. Go ahead and try it out for yourself. Have some fun with it. And coming up next, we're going to look at operators and how we can use operators within JavaScript coding. If you're a fan of math, this is the lesson for you. And of course, math is always the underlying part of programming. In the earlier lessons, we saw we can declare a variable. We can take that variable and we can use an assignment operator, which is the equal sign, and assign a value to that variable. And then that variable going forward will have that value until we change that value. There's also a number of other ways that we can make some updates to those very values. And we've got a lot of different operators that we can use. So if you are familiar with math, you are aware, obviously, of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and so on. So let's go take a look at how those work into JavaScript. So I can take value of five, add it together with five, and that's a typical math operator, the plus sign. I can also do five minus three and subtract it. So that's the minus sign. I can do five times four, and that's the multiplication. So it's not the X, it's the little asterisk, which is shift eight. And there's also 20 divided by five. So that's the forward slash is the division. And then we can get a value to that. So those are the typical math operators that you could use. You could also use increments as well. So we know that our variable A has a value of 400. So if I take A, I can quickly do A equals A plus one. And so that will give us a value of 400. And there's actually a shorter way to do that. So if I just want to increment by one, I could do A plus plus, and that will allow me to increment it by one. So now when I look at the value of A, it's 402. I can also do plus plus A, and that immediately returns back 403. And the result is that A is 403. So if you put the pluses after, the immediate returned value is still going to be 401 because the way that it reads it is from the left-hand side. So A will get 401, and then we uh, add in the operators. And when you're writing it within your code, it's actually going to be the same way. So as long as you're doing the statement there, it will increment it by 1, and then that new value of A going forward is going to be 403 or whatever value you've assigned to it. There's also a few other ones to be aware of that are typically used within math. So we've got one that's called modulus, and that's just represented with the number sign. So we have the, a value, and we can take the modulus, which is percentage, 3, and we see that it's returning back a two, value of 2. So why do you think that is? And the way that modulus works is it essentially returns back the remainder. So if we do 20 divided by 3, so we can fit in 6 3 times into 20, and 6 times 3 is 18, which gives us a remainder of 2. So basically, if we do something like 12 modulus 3, we get a remainder of 0 because we know that 3 times 4 is 12, and we can divide 12 by 3, and we have no remainder. So if you use something like 13, then we get a value of 1 as the remainder. And this is also a quick way to tell if the number that you're working with is odd or even, because we see that all of the odd ones get a remainder of 1, whereas the even ones get no remainder. So that's a quick way to use modulus. And you'll encounter that as well. It's another really useful part of JavaScript. So let's uh, go back into our coding and let's set up some variables. So we're gonna set a variable a equals five. And then we're gonna also, so we saw that we did that assignment value. So if we take variable b and we want to assign whatever the value of a is plus five, we can do it this way. And so now b will have a value of 10. So let's add that in. So we can use all of those operators here within our coding. B a value of 30, the value of B. So what do you think our new total for A is going to be? So A is going to be now 35. Because what we've done is we've used the equal sign, 
And that's important because that's assigning a new value to B. So what's happening here is this is essentially the same thing. So A equals A plus B. So essentially that's what we're writing. And again, this is that shorter format that we just saw earlier in order to make those and write that content. So one other thing I want to note before we end up and close off this lesson when we're looking at operators. So we've seen that the equal sign equates one value to the other. And we saw that the plus equals is a shorthand format for this one here. Now there is another one as well. So if we do something like A and we do two equal signs to B, we see that a Boolean value is being returned back. And this is what's known as a comparison operator. So these work a little bit different where we compare the two values, so the value of A and the value of B, and we see that if it's equal. Uh, we can also do something like we can put a number in there. And until we get the right number, we're not going to get the value of A being equal. So the value of A, I believe, right now is 65. So until we say 65, and that's because we've updated it here within these statements. Initially, it was still five, but we made the updates to it. So until we actually get the value of it, then we see the tr true being returned back. And that's that Boolean value. We can also use the less than symbol and the greater than, of course. So we can do A is less than. So this is comparison operator, which is different than the assignment operator. So we can see is A less than 50, is A less than 100, is lay less than 1500 and it's always true uh, so a is not less than one we can also do greater than so we can do is a greater than one true is a greater than 50 true is a greater than 500 false because remember again the value of a is 65 and we are going to be looking at these comparison operators in greater detail later on as it's going to become more relevant and more important in the later lessons. So for now, take what you've learned in this lesson, try it out for yourself, try the different math operators, add some values together, and usually I would suggest that the best place to do it within, within the console, play around with the numbers, and just get familiar with, get, with what's getting returned. And the other thing too to get familiar with is that how you're assigning values. So you could do something like variable C is equal to A, greater than 500 and now if we do C it's being returned back false because remember whatever we're assigning that value to is going to be whatever the end result of this equation is going to be and what we get back within the console anyway is undefined but we do have a number and we do have a value that's being re returned back there and that's false and we saw that played out earlier on within these statements where we saw that that was being returned back false. And again, there's gonna be more on this later on within the upcoming lessons. So in this lesson, just get familiar with the variables and how to use them. This lesson is gonna be the most important lesson on JavaScript, because we're gonna be looking at functions. And functions are a core part of what can be done with JavaScript. So what are functions? Functions give you the ability to return and run a block of code. And it gives you the ability to run that block of code multiple times. So remember before when we had on click and we could equal it and we could do something like the alert. And then when within the alert we had, and then when we refresh, we click the button and it invokes that little alert to pop up. Well, this essentially is a function and that's how functions work. They're a preset block of code that runs and it does something. And in this case, what we were doing is we were outputting the value of hello. So it's taking a parameter and knows what to do with the parameter. It pops it into that little alert button and it pops it into the dialog of the alert button. So great. What if we want to create our own alert? Instead of an alert, maybe we want to change the word JavaScript to something else. And this is where we can create that dynamic interaction. So let's do that. And we're gonna start by creating a function. The function, we can name functions as well, just like variables, where we were setting the values of those variables. And this is another one that we could customize what our value is gonna be. So we've got a function called message. And right now what it's doing is it's expecting a value to be passed in. So I can update alert 
I can send the value of hello there and nothing happens. And this is where uh, what we do with that content that's coming in and use it within our block of code. So we've got an argument that's being passed in there. Uh, so let's just put a variable name of A to hold that argument and we're gonna console log out the value of A. So let's see what happens. We click the button and wow, we've got something happening here. We've got hello popping up down there. So what do you think we would have to do and going back a few lessons where we had this document query selector inner HTML, remember this one? What would we have to do when we click the button that we could update the word JavaScript to a customized message. So that's the challenge and I'll show you the solution coming up. So if you want to take a crack at it, pause the video and I'll give you a hint. You've already learned what we need to do. So try that out and I'll show you the solution coming up. So the solution was actually really easy because we saw that we pass in this value of hello, we click the button, hello is showing up Where's that code coming from? It's coming from the function. So every time this gets clicked, JavaScript says, hmm, I know a function called message. I know where it's located, and I know what code I have to run whenever this function is called. So what's happening is function is being called. We're passing in an argument. The argument value is hello. So if you update this hello to hello world and refresh the page and click it, now it's hello world. So whatever passed whatever value, string value is being passed in there, it's being picked up within the function and the function is saying, okay, hello world is now equal to A and then I'm console logging out A. So the rest of the part was fairly straightforward where we did what we did earlier where we assign a value to the inner HTML of H2 and in this case, it's just equal to A. So let's see what happens. So do you think this is gonna work? Do you think uh, we still need to adjust something? What do you think is happening here? So when we click, we see that that's changing that value. And let's actually do something even more interesting. So let's set up a variable and I'm gonna call it B and we'll start it out at zero. So every time this gets clicked, we're gonna increment B by one. So remember last lesson, uh, shorthand format for B equals B plus one is just B plus plus. You'll see that used all the time. So now we've got a message of A, which is hello world, and we've got a value of B. So what if we want to output our message? So let's do that as well. So we'll set up a variable and we'll just call it output. And in this case, we're gonna do A plus, and remember how you can add in a space there. So that's the two single quotes and then the value of B. And instead of outputting just A, I'm gonna output output as the output. So what do you think is gonna happen now? Click the button, we get hello world one. So what's happening is that the code is run, the global variable, so outside of the function, that's a global variable. Inside of the function, that's gonna be a local variable with only uh, used within the function if it's declared within the function. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit more detail in the upcoming lesson. So what's happening here is B is assigned a value of zero. And every time I click this, we saw it could invoke and we could run this function. And then what was happening, it was running that function. We were passing in an argument, but over here we were incrementing B. So every time that button got clicked, B added one. And then we had an output of A plus space B, and we were outputting that. So that was our new variable of output, and it contained this newly created, freshly minted value. And what we were doing is we're simply outputting that value. So every time we click it, we're actually incrementing the value. And if I wanna see the value of B, I know that B is at seven. So every time I click it, B is no longer seven, it's eight. And so this is the core principles of what JavaScript can do because it gives us all of this flexibility and allows us to dynamically work with the code and update things and create that user interaction with the code. So now it's up to you. I've got a new challenge for you coming up in the next exercise. And what I want you to do is create three different buttons that are gonna invoke three different functions that are gonna update the values of each one of those. 
And what I want to happen is I want to output those values in that document ht h2 element. So I know it's a little bit of a challenge and I'll show you the solution coming up in the next lesson. In the previous lesson, I had a bit of a challenge for you. So let's get started. We needed to create three buttons and I'll make this a little bit bigger. So we can easily take our first button and we can duplicate and duplicate. And then the next one is that we needed three variables and we also need three functions. So let's uh, take this and we'll get rid of this one. We'll get rid of this one. And maybe how about we do click one, click two, click three, so we can distinguish between the different buttons. And they're all gonna invoke different functions. So there's our three buttons. Next, let's hook up our functions. And we also needed to set up three variables. So let's uh, call it var one and var two and var three. And we want them all to equal zero. So how can we do that? Let's do var one equals var two equals var three equals zero. Var one equals zero, var two equals zero, var three equals zero, var four does not exist. Perfect. So now we've set all of them to equal zero. You could have done it on separate lines as well. That's fine. So now let's take care of our functions. So notice we're not passing in an argument because we don't need to make use of the argument. All we're doing is doing that functionality. So message one, what message one is gonna do is it's gonna simply add var one. So it's gonna update and increment var one. And then what we can do, so let's uh, remove some of this stuff out, clean it up. And this one is a little bit more challenging than the previous one. So remember within the function, we've got those curly brackets and this is where all of the code that gets invoked is gonna be sitting. So let's see what happens. So message one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, whatever. Uh, so it keeps incrementing. So perfect, and we don't even need to console log that out. So we've got our function for message one and we've got a function for message two. And I know what you're thinking, there's probably a quicker way to do this. And I am gonna show you something later on within the course, but for now, let's just do it this way. So what happens now is we're incrementing these values and we're outputting, well, it should be var one, no space, uh, var two is four, var three. So the challenge really here is we wanna output that message value into here. And how do we do that? So we know with functions, we can invoke functions. So we can have a trigger and the trigger starts that chain reaction of the function. And what if we had a function, so this one, uh, we'll just call it message as we did before. And we're just gonna simply output whatever the value of the message is gonna be. And we know that we've got all of these variables. So we've got var one and let's uh, add in some spacing var two Again, add in some spacing and then var three. So we've got all of those variables. So let's uh, refresh and let's click these buttons a little bit. And under message, if we invoke the function method message, we see that that output changes. So every time we click and then we go back and we invoke message, we see that we've got the new number of clicks that has been established. But ideally what we want to do is, and what of course we want to happen, every time we click one of these, we want it to invoke that message function. And that's exactly it. Actually, I just told you what we need to do. And that's every time we increment the number, we need to do message. So let's do that. Let's do this and this one now. So now refresh and every time I click it, we've got a counter. So either going up and depending on which one I click, we've got the different numbers incrementing. So that's a solution to that challenge. I know this one's a little bit more difficult, but I do recommend that you do try this out for yourself and just get comfortable with writing functions, even though we had to write pretty much the same one over and over again, and also invoking functions from other functions.
because this is where we save time with functions. And this is a good indication of how we save time. We could have taken this and instead of message, we could have had it like this as well. And that would have worked the same way. But the whole idea of coding is that you don't want to write the same line of code more than once. So that's where you block it in and you place it within a function. And that's how you can access it and make use of it. So coming up next, we're going to get into function in a little bit more detail because there's some things that we kind of skipped over in the earlier lesson, and I do want to go over them in more detail. So that's coming up next. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There's more on functions that we need to cover. So let's go take two steps back and go back to where we introduced functions in this course. So we had seen that with a function, we could pass in an argument and pick that argument up and use it as a variable within our code. Now, we also noticed that within the function, we declared a variable called output, and we were using that variable within the function. But what happens if I take that variable and if I try, we see that output is not defined. So what's happening here? And the reason that output is not defined is because of global and local scope. So everything within the function is local scope. If there's a variable that's defined within the local scope, it's not seen outside of the function. So that's within the global scope. So you can very well have a variable called B and give it a value of zero. So you don't want to be reusing the same variables. When it comes to the local scope, so no matter how many times we click it and we see the value of B, is always going to be zero is because that's contained within the, the global scope. So even though I increment B by one, B will always be equal to one within this local scope because we're redeclaring that variable every time we're coming in. So that's much different than accessing the variable that's sitting outside within the global scope. So this is something important to keep in mind when you are working with variables Ones that are in the function only live within that block of code. Functions are really useful for is returning values. And let's say for instance, we were building a type of calculator and we built out a function that was taking two parameters to A plus B. And then we're gonna output that value there. So now we can use that function. It's requiring two parameters, so five plus 10. So what do you think is going to happen here? What do you think we're going to get output in the console? And if you said we're outputting 15 in the console, you're correct. So we can use this formula over and over again, and it will always output that value in the console. So this isn't really ideal with functions because sometimes what you want to do is you want to do this calculation and you want to return the results. And that's what's typically done with functions. So if I have a plus b, I do return. And what's going to happen here is when I do add 4, 5, we're going to see that it returns back 9. So what that means is that if I have another variable, and going back into declaring of variables, so 40 plus 50, what do you think the value of c is going to be? So C is 90 because what we're doing is we're doing a return on the function. And essentially what's happening here is that whenever we're invoking this, we're making the calculation and that return value is now that new calculation. And that's why we can do something like C equals add and then pass in two different numbers. And then now for C, we're invoking that function, that, fo that function is running, and C is now worth 150. So you can see that there's a lot of usefulness to what's happening within the code where we can do these types of calculations and output those values. So go ahead and try this out for yourself. Create several different functions and actually return back results for you within your code. And also get familiar with different local variables and global variables. So anything sitting on the root, that's going to be a global variable. So any one of the children are able to access it. Any one of the blocks of code that are into the next level are able to access it. But when you try to access stuff that's done locally within the function, you have no access to that. So keep that in mind as well. 
This lesson, we're gonna be looking at JavaScript objects, and I guarantee you're gonna love objects. The way that objects work is what we saw earlier, where if we have a person, and then we can assign some type of value to that person. So whenever we refresh, and if we type person here, we know that person is equal to this value. So objects are a little bit more interesting than, than that, and they give us the ability to have some properties associated to the different values. So we can have person, but person can contain multiple different properties within it. So let me show you what I mean. So let's go ahead and we're gonna declare person, but we're gonna do this one as an object. So refresh and go back down to person. And this is where we use those curly brackets. And these are the uh, famous ones for JavaScript, of course, because we do a lot of stuff with these curly brackets. So we've got person, and right now this object is pretty empty. So let's do some values in the person. So person can have a first name. Person can also have a last name. And so what we're doing is we're separating it with a dot, and that's giving us the ability to add multiple things into person. So let's see what person contains now. So person not only is just the person object, we've got multiple values that are contained within here. And then if we want to access those values, we write it out the same way that we set them, where we do person first, person last, and so on. So essentially it gives us a way to contain various properties together. So let's go back to our earlier lesson and we saw that we could create a function like this and have it output and do something. So it would be console log and this one would be fun one. Now there's also another way to create functions and you can create it as a variable and then declare it as a function. And then within the function, we do the same type of format where now we're gonna console log out and this time, what do you think it's gonna be? It's gonna be fun too. So let's uh, refresh that. And this time, let's do fun too. So we see that the fun too works the exact way as the fun function did earlier. So that means that we can also use it within that same type of format so we can invoke it as a method. So we could have something like message and then equal that to function and then within there, hello world. So that's gonna be the message that's coming from this particular person. So let's uh, do a refresh and person and now they've got a function that's associated with them, and then you can call that function within this type of format. So everything is contained within person. We've got first name, we've got last name, and we've got a message that we can invoke. We can also do things like numbers, of course. So we could do an age, and shh, I'm not gonna tell you my real age, so it's not my real age. Alive, and then we could do true, so we could do Boolean values. So now when I type in person, you can see that it contains all of this wonderful information. And that gives us access to it within that same object, which is really useful because we can contain everything within that same format. We can also return back, hello world here. And we can also customize what we're returning because now we've got access to the content that's contained within this object. So if we do something like this, first, it's gonna return back the value of first name. So let's try that out. And it says, hello world, or hello Lawrence. So let's update the person's first name and we'll equal that to, and now let's invoke person message and we see that it's changed because we have access to those values. And this is where I used an interesting one where I used this because in some cases, we might want to use this and we want to, might want it to be dynamic. We can also keep it at person first as well, and that will do the same thing. So this time if we change person, let's uh, change the name of person first. So now the message is hello, Lisa. So that was something to keep in mind as well, and we are going to look at this in the later lessons. But essentially when you use this, it refers to the current active object, and that's the what's known as the this keyword. 
So whatever the owner of this particular object is, and that's person, that's where this is going to take place. And this is a keyword in JavaScript, and it can be used in a number of different ways. So that's just one way to use this. There's also a short format as well, where you can take person one, and we're going to create a new object, and then list out all of those values so we can give them a first name. And this is separated by the colon. So the one on the left-hand side, the property name doesn't need to have quotes around it. And the property one, you can list them out. So we can do last. And in this way, it does always look a lot neater as well. So I'm not going to list out everything, but I think you get the point there that person one and person. And then if you want to update content in person one, you do it within the same thing where you can do first and then equals. So you can do something like Lawrence if you wanted to and so on. And then now person one is going to contain that new value. So this again is a nice way to work with JavaScript objects. And there's one other thing before we conclude the lesson. There's another way. So we saw that if we want to retrieve the information, we can do it within the same way that we're setting it up. And there's also another way, and that's going to be the bracket format. So we can do the same value within brackets where we use the square brackets and then we indicate the property name in order to get the value back. So we could do something like person first or we could do person last. And that's going to be actually equal to doing person first, person last, and so on. So those are two equivalent ways. And you can even set the values within this type of format. And generally, this is a little bit longer. Doing it within this type of format, it's a little bit more dynamic. And I'm going to show you an example of that coming up in the upcoming lessons as well. So now I've got an exercise for you to take a look around the room or to think of something that you own and describe it in as a JavaScript object. So if you have a car, for instance, do a full description of the car as an object. So list out some of the traits of it. So if you have a car, you can create an object called car and then update it and update the values that are contained within it. Welcome to exercise three, where we're going to create an object, a JavaScript object. Previous lesson, I showed you how to create an object and now it's up to you. So if you want, if pause the video and I'm going to show you how to create an object. So the objective of this exercise was to think of something that you can create an object out of. And most typically, the easiest one is a car. So that's what I'm going to do as well within this example. So first of all, we declare our object, and then we have the ability to add in values into the object. And we could have also done those properties within this type of format as well. So we could do something like color. And I don't actually have a red car, but always wanted one. So that's good enough. And we'll just uh, we'll do it within this type of way. So comma separated out. Uh, maybe we can have year of the car. So it's a 2010. And we can have a make of the car. How about a Corvette brand? So I believe it's Chevrolet and so on. So you could do uh, price, whatever the price was, how much you paid for it, 50,000 and so on. So really it's just uh, get comfortable with JavaScript objects, get familiar with them and how to create them, and then also how to retrieve back those values. So let's update and let's take the value of car and we're going to update it here within our h2. So instead of message, all we have to do is update this and output it. So we'll just do concatenate it together, add in space there. Again, car make and let's uh, see what that looks like. So red Corvette and play around with those numbers, move them around, output them, also put them within your console and be really creative, have some fun with it, get familiar with JavaScript objects. Great job on making it this far into the course. Next, we're going to look at arrays. Arrays give us the ability to hold multiple values within a single variable. So just as we saw before, where we create a variable, you can give it a name. So I'm going to call it my array. Or how about we call it my array one in case we want to create a few different arrays. Now arrays have some built-in functionality as well, which we're going to be taking a look at. 
So the first thing that we're going to do is create an array. So an array is indicated with the square brackets. And arrays are different than what we saw within the objects, where the objects had a property and then a value associated with it. Arrays are a little bit different because arrays are a list of items. So essentially, starting at zero, so the first index item value is zero. Let's uh, add in some values. So we'll create a string there, and we'll create a second item there. We'll create a third item there. We'll create a fourth item there. And notice that the data types, uh, they always take that same format. So you can see that these are strings, this is a number, this is Boolean. So let's uh, refresh, and let's take a look at what's contained within my array. And you see that we've got all of those values, but instead of the way that the object had it, where it had the property and then the value, we've just got a number. And this is an index value. Another interesting thing here is that we've got a length. So we can actually retrieve back the my array and we can get any array's length. And we can see how many items are sitting in that array. And that's actually really super useful. And we're gonna be making use of that later on as we go through the course. So next, let's look at how we can retrieve back those values. So we know that within the objects, we could specify, and we also saw these square brackets within the object as well. And we could specify it. So this one would have had first, that would have been last, that would have been age, and so on. But we don't have those same values in order to retrieve them. All we have is a number that they fall into this list. So this is the first one, but arrays start at zero. So in order to retrieve that, we have to indicate that my array one, zero, and then the next one, is one, then the next one is two, and going all the way to three. So in order to get the last value, it's gonna be three, it's not four. And that's sometimes kind of confusing with arrays because they do start the index at an earlier value. There's also ways to add in values within the arrays as well. So just as we saw earlier with the objects, where we can take the object name and then grab the index value. So if we want to take two, and if we want to put in a different age, let's see what happens. Let's refresh. And now let's see what the value for my array one and index two, which is the third item. I know, a little bit weird and confusing, but you'll get used to it. So that's 40. So we can do the same thing where we can update any one of those values, and all we have to do is reference the index value. So if we want to turn Lawrence into Lisa, now if we list out the array, we see that the array has actually changed. So it gives us the ability to change the values within the array, work with them dynamically, and so on. So we can also, so you're probably wondering, okay, well, what if I take the my array and I don't know what the next index value is. And let's say I guess that it's 50 and I'm equaling it to test. So what do you think has happened here within the array? So when we call back the array, the weird thing happens that we've got actually 51 items within the array. There's only five that actually have values, but the length of the array is how many items we have. So we effectively actually created 46 empty items. And that's what's going on here. So this is something to keep in mind when you're setting the value by the index number. So you don't get an undefined. You can declare, uh, it's already been declared, and you can set any index value you want. And if you're unsure about what the value is and you make up some number, then it's gonna actually automatically adjust the array. So the important key here is that there's no missing values, no missing numbers in the index. There's gonna be all the way from zero to 50, even though it's not being output here and even though they're sitting as empty. So keep that in mind when you are working with arrays that you can and you can make use of the different arrays within this type of format. So if you wanted to add another item to the end of the array, and actually I'm gonna do this within the code, I can take my array one, and we need to know what that last index 
value is going to be. And if we don't know what it is, we definitely need to have a number in there or we're going to throw an error. So how do you think that we figure that out? And if you were paying attention earlier, we did say that we can get the length of it. So what happens now is when I refresh, so that worked, and we see that we get the length of it as last. So basically, every time I take the statement and I do last, because the array of length is changing, so if I do it a bunch of times, and now I list out the my array, we've got 10 items in there, and that's because we've added in last. So every time there, so this is an actual number value that's being returned for it, which is five or six or seven or whatever it is at that current instant. And at that point, we're taking that index value and then we're applying a value of last to it. So that's what's happening there. And you can also be a little bit more dynamic on this as well. So now if I list out the my array, you see that it's four. If I repeat this value, and if I do it a number of times, we see that they always increment. So that's one way to, to do that. And coming up next, I'm gonna show you some array methods where we're gonna dive into the array and I'll show you some really cool things you can do with it. So that's coming up next. And there is a better way to add uh, content to your arrays as well as remove it. Let's go back a few lessons where we looked at comparisons. And we saw that whenever we output something where we have five equals five, and we see that it returns back a Boolean value. We could do five is less than nine, returns back true, five, or we could pick another number is greater than two, true, greater than nine, false. So we saw when we do these comparisons, we return back a Boolean value. And we can make use of these Boolean values within conditional statements. Conditional statements basically allow us to apply some logic into our application. So we can do something like this using the if statement and check to see if a particular value is equal or if the condition is true. So we can say if true and let's uh, refresh that and you can see the output in the console is was true. So if this is false, we refresh and we see nothing gets output in the console. So the same thing goes for when we do five equals five, we know that JavaScript does the computation here and it checks to make sure that this computation returns back a Boolean value. And when it does return back that Boolean value, if it was true, then it will output true because we've got that within the console condition. So essentially this is the block of code. So just like what we saw within the functions, these curly brackets contain a block of code that gets executed and this only gets executed if this condition is true. Then we can see, we can apply any one of those conditional statements that we have in there and we can apply it, refresh it. So we know that five is not less than three, but five is less than eight. And we're gonna see that that gets output as true. We can also, where we saw before with the comparisons, we also saw that we had logical operators. So we could do combined statements where we can have one value here. And remember, this is turning out and it's returning back true. And then we can apply additional condition. So we can do additional and, we can do an or and not. So both of these have to be true in order to output that value. So if one of these is false, then we're not gonna see any type of output here. So both of them have to be true on the and. There's also the or, so those are the two pipes. So if either one of these is true, it's gonna render this block of code. So even if one of them turns out to be false, so we know five is not greater than eight, so we see that it still renders that out. So that's the condition there that both of them have to be true, and if both of them are false, so both of them turn out to be false, then we render out nothing, because those two lines indicate that that is or. So or, uh, so if this is true or this is true. So let's uh, bring this back down just to the one condition there and refresh it. And we see that it's not coming out. So let's uh, five less than eight value when that condition is false, when that comparison is false, we can use else in order to output something. So if this is not true, we'll take the console log statement and write out, or we could have said false.
So now what's happening here is that we're looking at this comparison. We're seeing that this is returning back false, the Boolean value of false. So we know that it can either be true or false. So it's returning back false with that condition. So that's why this block of code is getting executed. We can also add in one other parameter as well, or we could add in more else if statements. So we can do else if, and we can see if five is equal to five, then it will render out that value. And if else, we can add in another else there at the bottom, and we can just say not true. A, and set that variable of A to five. So now we've got a bunch of values here. So we see if A is less than eight or greater than eight, or we can see that if A is equal to eight. So we'll just write out equal here, was less than eight. So we have di three different possibilities here, was more than eight, was less than eight, or was equal. So let's refresh it, and we see that initially five was less than eight. So what if we update this, and if we write out eight, so we say now it's equal, and let's do nine, and was more than eight. So that's how we can apply logic into our applications. So now it's up to you. Give it a try, create a variable, update the number, and then see all the different types of conditions and outputs that you can produce. Hope you had an opportunity to try that out. So let's introduce functions. And when you combine some of these fundamental core concepts of JavaScript, you get a lot of really cool functionality. So I've updated the onClick to send a value of five into a function called check. So let's produce that function and we'll have our number within here. And for now, let's just make sure that everything is working properly. So do console log. And we're also gonna block out this block of code for now anyway, refresh. So now when we click it, we see that we get the number of five being passed in. So we're able to pass in that numeric value on the function. So even if I do something like check 10, we can see that that value gets passed in to the function. So we're ready to take the next step and that's apply our condition. So we can pretty much copy what we had here where we were working with this earlier and we were setting these different values. So now instead of A, we're gonna use the variable num and we can replace all of those values with num. So let's try that out. And so we see that equal to, and we can pass in the value of num there, and we can say num, and this is just adding it into the string. So we're outputting that number value that's being passed in, so we can always see that value that's being passed in. And one more a uh, or a before we refresh and click it. So let's try that out. So we see that five is equal to five. Let me add in a space there. So now we can pass in different numeric values and we can see 99 was more than eight. And any value that we pass into here, we can see that equal to four and so on. So we're getting all of that functionality by combining the function as well as the conditional statements. And this is something that's often done. It's done quite often within programming. So what I want, what I want you to do now is try this out for yourself. So build out this check function and check to see what the value is. You can pick eight or you can pick another number, whatever number you want, and pass that in and update that whatever's being output into the console. And you can take this one step further, and we already saw this earlier, where we can output instead of console log, let's update that JavaScript to say that message. So that's the challenge for this lesson, and I'll show you the solution if you pause the video. So go ahead and pause the video and we just needed to add in that. And then what I'm gonna do is, I've already got this query selector down here at the bottom. So we're gonna just simply copy that out, paste that in, and we're gonna equal that inner HTML to whatever the value of mess is. And now instead of console log, let me update these and replace it with message. And we can also be more dynamic and I'll call it temp val. And so for now, we'll set it up as eight. And then I can go in here and I can replace all of these eights with that variable. So this one needs to be concatenated to the end of the string. 
and same with this one, and this one isn't actually going to be num equals num, it's going to be num equals temp val. So let's refresh and try it out. So 5 was less than 8. Let's uh, try out another number. So 9 was more than 8, and check, 8, and 8 equal to 8. So great, it's working well. We're outputting content into our HTML, and we can also run any number of functions we could also have some numbers attached there. And as we progress through the course, you're going to see even more really nice things that you can do with this type of functionality. So go ahead and try it out for yourself. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at loops. And what do loops do? They give you the ability to save you time by writing out a bunch of code really easily. So we can execute a block of code any number of times. So let's set up a more typical for loop. So we need to declare a variable that we want to use. We're going to set up using x. And then we're going to use that condition that we saw in the earlier lessons. And we're going to check to see while x is less than 10. And then we need a way out of our loop. And don't forget, you need to way out. So that's the increment of that loop value. So what is a loop going to do? So we'll see within the console. And what we'll do is we'll just console log the value of x. So we see that what happens is coming in, x is set to a value of 0, so it outputs that value in the console. And then once it finishes executing the block of code, it goes through this again. And while this condition is uh, true, it's going to continue that value. So at this point, when x reaches a value of 10, 10 is no longer less than 10. So that's where we break our loop. And all the time, every time we're iterating through, we're incrementing x by 1. So that's the quick and easy way to create loops, which give you the ability to write code multiple times. So as well, we could just as easily put this out into message. And the thing with message is, though, it's going to overwrite whatever the last value is. So we're going to end up with a 9 in there. So it's not going to show as nice and neatly as we saw within the console. So there's a bunch of different types of loops. So for loops are some of the most common ones. They're also used often in conjunction with arrays. So let's set up a quick array. And I'm just going to use numbers within the array. And we saw that with arrays, we had a length value. So we know that we can loop through while x is less than the my array length. And we also saw that arrays start at zero, so we can keep that value there as well. And then instead of outputting it, I'm going to go back to the console message so we can see the full output there. And instead of outputting the whole array, we're going to select each array item as we iterate through it. And you can see that what it did is it simply looped out and looped through all of the items in the array and executed out those numbers that were contained within the array. We can also loop through objects as well. So we've got an object here. And I'm going to create a really simple object here. So give it first. So first, first name. And last. And you can have any number of items here within the object. So I'm going to just create a really quick and simple one. And if you want to loop through the values within object, you can set as variable x in my object. And this gives us the ability to loop out those values so we can console log out. And we've got some options here as well. So we can do the my object. And we saw that with arrays before that we can use the array key name like this. So let's see what happens. So we see that it loops that out. And if you want to see just the key itself, so we can output x there as well. So as it's looping through, it's going through first, it's going through last, just like what we saw within the array. And of course, arrays have the index values. So what we're doing is x is equal to first. So this is the same thing as saying first and then saying last. So let me change that back. Now, there are different types of loops as well. So most commonly, you will encounter the for loops, but there's also while loops. So while loops work within the same format. So going up to our for loop, where we had that up here, where we set initial value. Let's create that initial value as well. 
So do variable x. Another type of loop that is commonly encountered in JavaScript is a while loop. So this one is a little bit different, but the structure is the same thing. So we need to set a variable, or set a variable of x, set it out to our starting value, which in this case is gonna be zero. We're gonna loop through x while it's less than the value of 10. And then this is the block of code that we're gonna be executing out. So we output console and allow for now, let's just output x. And we also need a way out of our loop. Just as before, we need to increment x in order to find a way out of it. So let's refresh. And you can see that this is the while loop that's running down here. And literally, it's the same thing as the for loop. There is a big difference here, though. Uh, so if I do set the value to 10, we see what happens here is that it doesn't run at all. So if you do need to execute the block of code at least one time, that's where you can use a do loop. So in this case, I'm gonna use i. So set the value of i to zero, and then we're gonna do, and then this is where we execute the block of code. So we'll output the value of i there. And then we need a way out of the loop. So that's where we do that increment of i. So if you don't find a way out of the loop, uh, then you're gonna, uh, the browser's gonna continue to try to run that until it times out. And then next, uh, we need to add the while. So we're adding the while here at the end. So this is part of the do while loop. Uh, and we're gonna while it is while i is less than 10. So see, it's pretty much literally the same thing as the do loop. So let me change this one back to zero. So you can see that it's, it's the same thing, same output. And the difference here is if we change i to 10 and we refresh it, we see that what's happened here is that it runs it one time. So this is the actual invoking of this loop where we're going through the do loop and it runs it at least one time because the condition is afterwards. So our condition is sitting after we actually execute that block of code. So if you do need it to run at least one time, then you can do a do while loop. If you want to execute a number of times, you can do a while loop. And probably the most common way is doing it within the for loop. And then you've got some options with arrays and objects to output the content of those as well. So I know we've got covered off quite a bit within this lesson, and I do want to give you an opportunity to try this out for yourself. The different types of loops, try them out for yourself, create an array, create an object, or you can take one of the ones from the earlier lessons and output that within your console. This lesson, we're gonna have some fun with strings, looking at string methods. So first of all, let's create a string. We'll call it my string one, and then just create some content there. And now we can use that string, and we can, just as we saw with arrays, we can do my string one, and we can get the length of the array. So basically that's gonna tell us how many characters are available. So even if we add in some spaces, do you think the string length is gonna change? And if you said yes, you are correct. So even though it will display it the same way when it outputs it in the HTML, those are still characters. So all of those empty spaces that you can't see also count as well. We can also find a position, or we'll just call it needle. And looking through the my string one, we can get index of, so just as we saw with arrays, we've got a bunch of methods that are available. So if we wanna know where world is located, we can output that content of needle from within the string. So let's try that out. So refresh, we see it's located in character position number nine within the string. We can also, if we have world several times within our string, so let me add world in several times, we can see that the index of finds only the first one. So that's where we can do needle last and we can do index of, but we can just add in in front of index of, we'll do last index of. And what that will do is that will find out where the last value of world is gonna be sitting. So I refresh that, that's in position number 38. You can also do a starting position as well. 
So if, for instance, we still wanted to use index of, we can specify where we want to start index of. So we know that it comes in at nine. So let's do find and find. So let's uh, see what happens now. So we see that we're picking up this one here, which is starting at position number 31. We can also search for it as well. So let's paste that again. And this time we'll call it needle search. And instead of index of, so we're still specifying the string that we want to use. And we're using the search method. So we're going to find world. And we're actually just finding that first instance of it as well. So there's a number of options when you work with strings and it gives you some flexibility with your strings in order to find content that's available within it. And just like the arrays, when we do index of, and if it doesn't exist in the string, then you're gonna get returned back a value of negative one. So taking what you've learned in the earlier lessons, this is where we've got an exercise where we're gonna make use of what we've got within the string methods. And we're gonna look through creating a function that's going to actually check to see if a word exists in the string. So that's what I want you to set up. You can use the string that I have. You can create your own string and then also output it within H2, updating it whether the word exists or not within the string. And if it does exist, whatever position it exists at. So this is a combination of using the function and the condition to check to see if this method is returning back a negative one or if it's a numeric value. So we're gonna to have to use make use of that condition in order to output our correct output within the H2. So go ahead and try this out for yourself and I'll show you the solution coming up. So let's take what we've learned in the earlier lessons and we're gonna set up a function, call it check, pass in an argument. We're just gonna pass in a value in it. And then within here, so first of all, let's uh, console log out just to make sure our check is working properly and we can refresh. And let's do check, check one, and that's working properly. So the next thing that we want to do is check to see within our string. So we do have our string. We're just going to use the my string value there. And we're going to check to see if that string has an index of whatever the value is. So let's uh, do that. So we check our value and we're going to return that back within the variable called check value. So we've got the my string one, use the method index of in order to locate the value and we'll console log out check val so we can take a closer look and see what's happening so let's do check one and we're getting back a value of negative one so we can use that within the condition that we can see if check val is less than zero which it is if it doesn't find it then we do something and else we do something else and also create that function message where we're taking in the argument of message and then what we're going to do is we're simply going to output whatever value was passed in there so we're going to make use of that again as well so within our check let's output to message and basically what this means if it's less than zero so if that value is true then it wasn't found and we'll put a sad face and if it was found found at and then this is where we know that we've got a value for check val. So let's output that value position. So let's uh, try that out. So let's do a check and check for value of one, not found. And this time let's uh, look for something that actually exists in there. Uh, so instead of one, let's do an uppercase one. Because again, it is case sensitive. Found at 17 position in the string. And we can also do any one of the words that are available in there. Or if we don't even have to do words, we can do part of the words, letters. So it's just looking for a string value. So it doesn't necessarily need to be the actual word. We can even go to the first letter of E if it's in the string. So we see it's found at position one and so on. And we can be even more specific if we wanted to. So we could do three and we could look for two three, see where that's located. So that's located position 21. So go ahead and try this out for yourself. Try out that challenge and that exercise and locate the position of the string that you're searching for within the string that you've got. This lesson, we're going to be looking at some new 
ways to declare variables, and that's going to be using let and const. So in the earlier lessons, we got used to declaring a variable where we would declare with var and then assign a variable value. And we also saw that within a function, we could have variables and they would only live within the scope of that function. So it would be living within the function scope. So we're not actually declaring the variable twice. We can go back out here and we can see that a is equal to one. And even though I run test and I go back to a, a is still equal to one. And there is a big difference between when we're declaring those variables within the function scope and when we're not. So we see that a is equal to one. Now I run the function and what do you think the value of a is? It's gonna be equal to two because we've reassigned a new value to it. So that was the big difference that we saw earlier that this was working within the function scope and this variable was only living within the function scope and then outside here, so this one's living within the global scope. And with the newer versions of JavaScript, we got introduced to let and const. And the way that they work is they're only available within the blocks of code. And we also saw that the blocks of code sit within functions, they sit within loops and so on. So they're represented by those curly brackets. So if I set a variable and I do let a and a equal to test, and then I console log out the value of a. And generally you wouldn't be doing this. You wouldn't have a global variable a and then be using it here as well. So you see that it actually outputs that value of test. And when I go to a, a is still one. It hasn't been reassigned because this is only available within this block. So you commonly might see it being used instead of var when you're doing a for loop, use a let. And that's going to allow that variable only to live within that block of code. And then we'll loop it while i is less than 1. Increment i. So while we're within this block of code, we can console log out the value of i anytime. So let's check that out. And we see that we loop through the value of i. And whereas now, if we try to access i, we're going to see that there's no value associated with it. So there it, i is not defined. Whereas if we do a var and let's use y equals zero and loop while y is less than five. And of course the results are gonna be the same within the console. But when we try to access the value of y, it's actually gonna be lingering around after. So let's see what happens. So now if I do y, we see that y is equal to five. And this is, gonna not really work very well because the idea here is that we only wanted to access i within this block of code and we didn't want y to be lingering around afterwards. So it becomes problematic and it's always best practice to use let and const when you can. And the difference between let and const is that once you're setting a variable, so let's say for instance, you've got const this time. So we'll use a as well. So we set a variable for const and then we take const and we try to change it to world. And you can see that's gonna throw an error. Whereas if this was let, then that would be fine and it wouldn't throw any errors at all. And within this block, the value of a would be, the value of a w sitting in here would be world. So that's the difference between let and const. And I, it is suggested that you do try to use them in place of var. So that it's replacing var and it's only available when you're only for values that you need to have access within a particular block of code. So go ahead and try this out for yourself. This lesson, we're going to be taking a closer look at the DOM, the document object model. And this is again, that representation of what's being output. And this is generated by the browser. And when we access the document object, we saw we've got a ton of different methods that were available. So when we do something like document, we see we've got all of these methods. So we can get the URL, and this gives me the URL of the web page. We can also do document. All of this is available for us, so we can do document body. So this is all of the contents within the body tags, which we can automatically grab and then make use of as needed. We can even do document. So everything is contained within here. And there really is a lot of stuff here that you can do with it. We can also create elements. So we can create an element on the fly. We can do something like create elements and div. 
and so on. Uh, and what this does is this creates a div. Uh, we can also append it into our HTML so we can dynamically generate elements. And this is all about making that interaction and connection with your HTML content and JavaScript. And we could just as easily output this information. So we can take document URL or document body, but let's just use document URL and update our value here. So when we load the page, it's going to output whatever the value is within the page of the document URL. So these are all values. And just as we saw with the objects, in fact, it is a giant object with a ton of information in it. We saw that we can access object data by doing the object name and then the property. And we could go in and we could access that information as a string value. And that's just what's happening here. So there's a number of other things that we can do as well, and we can pick up information. So let's do something like input. So basically what happens is you can actually grab this value from your document object and then use it within your JavaScript. So let me show you how. So we'll keep that same message. And then within message, what I want it to do is I want to take the value of input and I want to output it within my H2 element. So first of all, let's grab that value and we'll just uh, create temporary holder for that. And using the document object, we can use query selector and there's a bunch of other ones as well. So we can get element by ID. So that's another popular one. And here you just need to specify the ID. So the ID is my input. And now if I console log out temp, let me show you what happens. So we'll refresh, we click the button, we're logging out that value there. So we can take this and we can actually get a value of it. So click and we see that whatever value is contained within there, we can output within the console. So then we're not far away from outputting it within our HTML. So let's uh, create one and we'll just call it output. And what this will do is this is going to take that document object. So sometimes what I like to do, if there's an element that I'm going to be using often, I'll set up a const for it. And this can be my element or whatever we want to call it that we want to output and grab it as we did before using the document because it's all contained within that document object. And we can use the get element by ID. And then of course, then we'd have to still add in an ID to that. So I'm just going to use query selector. And if you have more than one H2s, you could be in a little bit of trouble here, but query selector will just grab the first one by default. So now this is, contained within the element and I can actually output it whatever that content is using the my element and I can add in these functions the inner HTML and then whatever value is being passed here so just call it message and then within here actually I'm not going to call it message I'll call it mess so let's uh, refresh and uh, let's just do an output and test that out so it's updating that message. That's exactly what we want. So what we want to happen is when we click the value, I want it to output this value into the HTML. So knowing and seeing what you've learned in this lesson, what I want you to do now is pause the video and complete this task. So update that content that's contained within the H2 element whenever you click the button this has to overwrite whatever is written in here. So try that out for yourself and I'll show you the solution coming up. So now for the solution of this challenge and what we wanted to do was output that value, that this value into the HTML element, the H2 HTML element. And the solution actually was actually really easy because we had done quite a bit of the work during the lesson. So now whenever I click it, you can see that whatever value is contained within here is actually being output within that element. So go ahead and try it out for yourself and create this type of functionality where you've got an input field, you click a button, and then you output the content within the HTML. So you want your users to be able to interact with your JavaScript. And as mentioned before, 
we try to separate out our JavaScript from our HTML code. And especially if you're linking to a JS file, when you have an on-click message, this doesn't really work within the best format. So we can actually get rid of this and add in an ID and we'll give it a name of, and we can also grab that element. So we'll grab my button document. We can use query selector. And this time we're grabbing it by ID. So we need to specify just as we would with CSS using the hash for it. So that's going to also put the my BTN into the JavaScript so we can make use of it. And the next thing that we wanted to do is we need to hook up that event listener. So that's what they're called in JavaScript. And now that I've got the my button object, I can add an event listener to it. So that's add event listener. And the event listener that I'm going to be adding is listening for a click. And then when it gets clicked, I want to invoke the function message. So let's try that out. So now when we click it, it's doing the same thing and the code is much cleaner and easier to read. And then we've got that separation of our JavaScript from our HTML. So we can take this JavaScript code and we can put in a JS file, link it to our page and any page that has an ID test button, we're going to be able to apply that clickable function to it. So you don't necessarily even need to have a click button. This could very, just as easily be a div as well. And that's a, the same thing for the on click. So whenever we click that div, we make, totally made it clickable and it's functioning as a button as well. And in this case, you, have to do, you do have to apply some styling so that the users can tell that this is a button. So go ahead and try this out for yourself. Add an event listener and remove out all of your JavaScript for HTML, creating that separation. This is the lesson where we're going to be bringing together all of the previous lessons and building out a really cool mini application. So first of all, for this application, we're going to need some inputs because what we want the user to do is to be able to input a value and then check to see if that value is odd or even and then output that within our HTML. So I've cleared out all of the content and we're starting out completely fresh. So first of all, let's create a div and we're going to create a div and this is where we're going to drop our output. And we also need an input field. So this is just type and regular text input, or actually this is going to be a number. So we'll set it as type number. So that's with HTML5, you're able to do that. Uh, we can also give it a name. So it's the same thing that if we're submitting it, we'll give it a name of my num. And we'll also use some more HTML5 attributes. So we've got a min and we've got a max and so on. And let's set a default value. So we'll start out with a default value of four. So the next thing that we need is we need a button. So we need a way to be able to, something that can be clicked that we can actually check to see if that value is correct. So let's do type and type as button. And we can also give this one a name or we can give it an ID. So let's give this one an ID and we'll call it test button. So there we go. So that's for our HTML and that's all we really need to do for the HTML. So what we want to happen is we press the check button and that invokes the JavaScript function in order to check to see if this value is odd or even. So let's try that out. So within the script, there's a few variables that we need to set. So first of all, let's set a const for our output and we'll give it a variable name of output and we can do document. And this time let's do get element by ID. So that's another commonly used one. And if you're just using IDs, then this is probably one of the easier ones to just grab that element. We can also grab this button ID. So let's do const. I usually like to call them the same thing as the ID and we'll do get element by ID. And then this one is called test. So on test BTN, we're going to add an event listener. So the event that we're going to listen for is a click. And the function that we're going to invoke is check value function. So we can close that off. And now let's create that function. And we don't have to pass in any arguments. And so for now, usually when I 
create the functions as I'm building it out, I like to just to make sure that everything is working as expected. So when I click the check button, it's uh, invoking the function, it's outputting it within the console. So that's perfect, exactly what we wanted. So next, what we wanna do is we wanna get our temp value. So we can just call this val or whatever we wanna call it. In this case, document. And in this case, we're gonna use query selector. So I did say that was one of my favorite ones. So this one's a little bit more complex because we know that we've got an input, we've got a type number, we don't have any IDs, we've got two different inputs there. So it's a little bit harder to grab this one. Uh, so there is a nice way to do that. And the reason I'm showing you this because this is also really useful within JavaScript. So we've got our input and then we can specify what values are contained within that input. So we can do name, we'll grab all of the inputs that have a name of my num. So that's our current value there. And we can, might as well just grab the full value at the time. So console log out val, just to make sure that everything is still working properly. So let's uh, change the value there. And for some reason, it's uh, the JavaScript's not working exactly, or the HTML isn't working exactly, and I've got a max value of zero, and that is probably why, so let's refresh that. So now we're able to increment and decrease our values. That's HTML5. Uh, so great, our values are being shown within the console. So we're literally just a few steps away from being able to finish up this application. And it's gonna require a parameter, an argument that gets passed in, and that's gonna be a number. And what we'll do is we'll console log that number that gets passed in. And over here, what we'll do is we're gonna do num checker. And I'm making it a little bit more complicated than it has to be, uh, but we did wanna get into the practice of all of the stuff that we're doing here within JavaScript. Uh, so next thing that we can do is we can do inner HTML, and we could also add this into another function as well. So we're gonna output the inner HTML of whatever is returned back from num checker. So let's return back a string value of nothing yet. So let's see what happens. So we just get nothing yet. So what we need to do is to determine whether num is odd or even. So if we go back a few lessons, we had a value that we had of being able to check if a number is divisible by another number and if there's a remainder, and that was the modulus. So if we take num and if we do modulus of two, what do you think is gonna happen here? Uh, so if there is a value here, then this is gonna come back true. And if there isn't, then it's gonna, uh, it's gonna come back false. So let's set up a variable, call it message. And for now, we're just gonna set that as blank. And then in here, message is gonna be, and then let's use else. And then what we're gonna do at the end of the function, simply gonna return back message. So let's uh, try that out. Even, it was odd, it was even, and so on. So any number we enter in there, it does the check to see if it's odd or even. And by determining if there's a remainder, and that's the thing with the true or false as well, the Boolean values, so they can be ones or zeros. So if the remainder is zero, which it would be if it's an odd number, or if it's an even number, then there's no remainder when you divide it by two. And that's how we know that it's even and if there is a remainder, it doesn't matter what it is, we know that it's odd. So that's how you can build out a simple application using all of the functionality that we've tried and gone through in the earlier lessons. So now it's up to you. Try this out for yourself. Get comfortable with making selections of the various elements on your page, getting values that are contained within them, and then also updating those values that are contained and doing all of this using JavaScript. Also incorporate functions where you can, apply conditions as well where you can, and see what you can do with JavaScript. Thanks again for taking the course.